Hey there, fellow lost ones. I was like you once. Alone, pathetic, weak, depressed, depraved. But then I found a book and I opened up that book. And that book gave me the power to do anything. Come on, come on, you can do it. Hey, Pru Pruitt? What? Are you, are you all right? We're yeah, we're, I was being pa no. power gaming. It's not like those guys who came to the gym. But we're, we're talking about power gaming. Okay, well, let's talk about power gaming on WebDM. Yeah. It's gonna be all right. Let's get to it. Let's get our reps in. Mm. Let's mm. talk about power gaming. Ooh. Let's, uh, what, so what exactly is power gaming? Mm, for yeah. the folks at home that might not know this, uh, sure, sure, sure. Time honored tradition. Time honored, yeah. To me, power gaming is uh, a philosophy of, play, uh, of gaming, a play style that's uh, about squeezing the most out of a game system to achieve a specific goal. The connotations with power gaming is that that comes with the exclusion of other considerations, right? Yeah. Like you squeeze the most you can out of a, a game system because you don't want others to be as powerful, or because you just want to fulfill some sort of like power fantasy or something like. Like that. Those mm -hmm. are kind of the negative ways of looking at it. I look at it more as, um, you know, why would you power game? Because you enjoy a greater chance of success at your character's endeavors, or you enjoy the rules mastery that comes with like knowing a system mm -hmm. in and out and, and making those choices, or it's just an optimizer. You're just an optimizer, right? Or, or maybe you just enjoy being a badass. You know, you just like a character that can kick ass and take names. I mean, People do like big game heroes, don't they? <laughs> right. I mean, that's that's why I always kind of confused me with a lot of the negative connotations of it. Yeah, and and like to me, you also would, might power game because survival, because you you might just be in a kind of game or be playing a system that encourages power gaming, right? In a lot of ways, uh, you know, a version of Dungeons and Dragons like Third Edition encourages it. You know, there are good and bad choices to make with skills and feats and everything, and you know, if you make a, a character that that dies, they, they can't survive, then the game's over for you. And so you would want to look at those options and go like, well, which one's going to make me the most survivable or something? Anyway, those are all some reasons why you might power game. It has nothing to do with, uh, you know, bringing others down or making the game less fun for them. But nevertheless, there are some negative associations with power gaming that is just, regardless of the era of gaming, mm -hmm. seem to uh, be associated with this uh, play style. Yeah. You know? Oh, you don't actually want to role play the game. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. You don't actually want to role play or you want like, oh, those high stats are there because you're fulfilling some sort of power fantasy. Yeah. You know? What are you compensating for? Right, right, right. <laughs> you know? As if playing characters with lower stats were somehow inherently better or, or mm -hmm. uh, a, you know, a greater challenge to role play or something. I, I disagree with that view. It's a common one, but it... Yeah. It's, uh, it, to me, it borderlines on the bad, wrong, fun, sort yeah. of like, you don't like it when the power gamers say the same about you, so what's the deal? I'm a uh, wizard know. with a tin intelligence that I've never learned to spell. It's never like, you know, you're just I'm having so much more fun. Proud of their, of, as an aside for that, like yeah. now that we brought it up, like <laughs> those kinds of characters where they have, say, like a really, uh, you know, really low stat in something are, I look at them like, why are we, like, what are we, what's, what's the point of like making a character that wouldn't otherwise survive in a deadly environment, especially okay. to the exclusion of the group considerations and things like that, yeah. right? So anyway, the two, like, negative associations that I see, you sort of brought one of them up, that they're bad role players. They're not going to get into it the way that others yeah. will. And that... They'll get into their turn. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. then, then uh, I don't care about anything. Yeah, you know, or that they're disruptive about it and, and not even allow other people to engage mm -hmm. in that role playing. Uh, and the other one for me is, you know, in the maximizing of, of their options, right? And in getting the most out of the system, the power gamers become like a detriment to the group somehow, yeah. right? That they're not good players. They're not good teammates, rather. Uh, and, yeah. and that they just do things that make the game less fun for others. Yeah. Um, now, this is true, right? Like, if you've got a person at your table who's a power gamer and they will not shut up about it, they will not, <laughs> like, leave you alone about it, then that's a problem, right? Like, mm -hmm. that player needs to be quiet and they need to yeah. stay in their lane. <laughs> yeah, my character's so awesome at blah, blah, blah. Like, I yeah. don't even need the wizard. It's yeah. like, dude, when yeah. you need to fly at some point, you're going to need the wizard. Right, and, yeah. and, and a game like 5th Edition encourages that kind of team play because it's, it's less likely that you'll make a character that doesn't need the rest of the group mm -hmm. right or I've seen this where you make a whole plan and then the power gamer at the table runs in and, and just 
no, just yeah, blows it, it up because they want to get the big hit in first. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just like, but we were going to stun it so you could yeah. hit it better. I don't know. I, I'm getting ahead of myself a bit because I've always been a person who, when I looked at a game system mm -hmm. and I was like, if I um, have a character in, in this game and I haven't done everything I know is possible to make that succeed, then there, I will not feel good about the failure, right? Like I'll feel sort of like, well, I could have done so much more. I could have taken this thing and that thing. And for me personally as a player, that's a tension that I, I, I like having to navigate because yeah. I want both. I want the uh, narratively satisfying, the character arc, the development, all that, that, that comes through play. But I also like power gaming and I like optimizing and I like having a character that's mechanically um, sound and, and sophisticated, right? That, that uses little rules quirks or that finds something within the game system that I can even sort of like reverse engineer to role play out or something. Right. For me, it's not about combat always. It's not about doing the most damage. Sometimes it's about being the toughest, right? Like. You know, I just if don't you live longer, die. you can do more damage over time. <laughs> right. For uh, my character Zelo in Arcane Trickster, it was about never getting caught. They were a spy. The thing that I wanted to optimize was their spyness. So that accounts for the fact that he's this weird multi-class character that mm -hmm. has all these sort of odd abilities, and it, you, he doesn't even—he's not attuned to the best items that he has all the time. He, he, you know, it's a the choices that I've made for him are entirely with the eye towards I, I never want this character to ever get caught or ever be like discovered magically or to have their plans discovered by anything and mm -hmm. so that that was how I approached everything from play style to mechanical choices that's sort of my general approach to power gaming but I got into it because I got tired of my characters dying and well, <laughs> I, so I wanted to make characters that survived particularly because we had that one DM who was yeah. Very lethal. Very lethal. Um, uh, did not pull any punches yeah. and, and would laugh gleefully uh, while taking your character sheet away from you. Sure, um, yeah. But I was pretty much a power gamer from the beginning, but I'm an optimizer. When mm -hmm. I do something, I like to look and get everything on my side that I possibly can yeah, yeah. before making an excursion. So coming to D&D, &D, it was just like, oh, this is fun. Oh, I can do that and I can do this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, fans of the show, it's no secret. I'm a power gamer. Sure. But when you start tying that into the narrative, mm -hmm. it is in all of our narratives anyway. In the stories that we tell, usually the hero is trying to be the best at something, be the best in the world. If you're an Afro Samurai, I want to be the number one. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I mean, like, it's literally ingrained. I want to be the champion. If you're yeah. Rocky, I want to knock off Apollo Creed. Right. Right? That's my thing is, like, a lot of the negative, you know, like, when you talk to people, I'm like, oh, you're a power gamer. You do sometimes get that. And I, I think that the person that they are reacting to is not me personally. Right. Yeah. So I'm usually just kind of like, well, I, I'm sorry that that's your experience with power gamers, right? Like, I'd love to have us play together because you'd see it's a very different thing, you yeah. know? You probably wouldn't even know I was doing it. Um, <laughs> but it's a play style that I enjoy because I, I'm sort of in a similar vein where you are, where I, I, for me it's about making sure that the mechanics of the game support my concept. Yeah. to their fullest. Because I'm usually a dungeon master, I am I I would get asked by Pruitt and other players who I had, like, hey, I'm thinking about this thing or that thing. I'm thinking about this particular type of character. What do you think? And so these conversations would come up where we would discuss the mechanical choices the players were making before a game or during a game. And so I, I felt like a, a, an intense need as a dungeon master to know everything about my you know, at least the classes and races that the players were uh, were considering. And so when you guys would come up and ask about it, I'd be like, oh yeah, well you could do this or that, or there's some combos I've heard about. And I was always clear to like never be pushy about it with right. you guys, to let you take the lead on how much you wanted for your characters, mm -hmm. but always there with a, a, uh, an opinion or comment um, that's like, oh yeah, this is you know a really powerful ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one way to this use This is one way ability. to use it. I've had players who accept that advice and they, they mm -hmm. take the character, and I've had others who go, oh yeah, thank you for letting me know that that's what that is. I'm still going to go with this less powerful mm -hmm. option or this option that's not considered the best. Yeah. And lo and behold, years of great gaming, <laughs> you know, in, in a group with people who have mixed opinions and approaches to optimizing, you know? Oh, yeah. Like, I would say an example for that in Sword Bound when uh, Trey came to me and was like, hey, I want to do a monk, but I can't, you know, what, what should I do? And I was just like, well, I've played a, a, a Kinsai monk, mm -hmm. and in my opinion, they're the best. You can do what you want. And I kind of explained the abilities and mm -hmm. what they can do. Yeah. And he immediately latched onto that. And then I immediately was like, and I highly recommend Longsword. Yeah. Longsword, using your decks, 
You can use it two-handed. You're getting a D10, <laughs> right. which is the max that your monk <laughs> weapons yeah, give yeah. anyway. Yeah. So you're doing that from the beginning with one of your weapons. Yeah. And it just like I just kind of laid that out, and I was like, but you don't have to do that. You can you choose. Do anything. You can yeah. choose bigger weapons if you yeah. want, or yeah. better weapons. Some of them. Yeah. Um, but laying it out for them to to see that like this is just this is a way you could do this, and letting them make the choice. I think your players will will thank you. For that. Particularly yeah. if, if they are new and the game seems very complex, they're aware of the choices that they have to make. They're aware that most places, choices have a consequence, right? They, mm -hmm. There's a reason there's a choice. Uh, it, you know, they might feel like, I don't want to mess this up. And so if you are a dungeon master who's sort of like inclined to optimization yourself, being able to be there to just reassure them or to warn them. You know, if they are worried about messing up and you notice something big, you know, you don't want to like make the decision for them like Pruitt's saying, but you might want to point out and just say, hey, this could come up. This might be an issue. We'll handle it if it does. Mm -hmm. But just so you know, uh, and I think like having that kind of openness and transparency, if it is welcomed, is a big asset. And why you would want power to play with power gamers, right? Because they have that kind of insight and approach. When I think about my personal approach to power gaming, it's, it's entirely wrapped up with the fact that we played mostly third edition for a while, that we had the same group for most of that period and, and developed our play styles in that environment. I just kind of think about all the other people who've experienced power gamers or the, that approach and it's been a disaster. They stopped gaming because of it or, or just swore off, you know, like I'll never play with a power gamer ever, uh, which is usually the comments that I see. Yeah. <laughs> what are some ways that a power gamer out there could maybe look at their own, do a little introspection, mm. see like, you know, because like we were talking about earlier, oh, they're bad at RP, oh, they're, oh, not, yeah, yeah. they're, not, yeah. good, they're not good with a team. Yeah. Looking at these negative associations and sort of like considering what goes into them I think is important because mm -hmm. this is what often happens in, in these sorts of online fights or in sometimes real life fights where people with different play styles feel very passionately and, and uh, come into conflict is that you know all nuance flies out the window you, you sort of forget all the things that factor into whatever. To me the number one uh, elephant in the room when it comes to power gamers are, are players who are of an immature age. Right? There's The game is open to people of all ages and play styles and, and whatever and you can there's very little uh, organization in who plays with who and the kinds of experiences you have. Mm -hmm. I, I like that about RPGs. Uh, but it does mean that um, an important component to RPGs, which is the, the social component, the, mm -hmm. the part that's not the game, the part that's sitting around with other human beings and, and expecting a certain uh, <laughs> treatment and, and to treat others uh, similarly, is something that takes people a long time to develop or at the very least, they might get together to play this game before they've fully developed a sense mm -hmm. of how to behave. And so, well, I mean, that's to me like a big elephant in the room with this. Yeah. How many people had these experiences when they were like 14 and carried through their entire lives? You know? Well, yeah, I mean, but the thing is, is age can be a thing, but just basic emotional maturity. Sure, yeah. Because yeah. like at, at well, uh, what was the, the con that we were at? We were playing with, with one of the, these game developers' kids who's like eight years old or, or nine years old. Oh, yeah, and yeah. He, he's already run more D&D. He's at the highest level character in the table. That was it, a game hole, yeah. Yeah, and he's uh, like telling, <laughs> like we're sitting there looking at the, Swords and Wizardry, he and he's more, like, "Oh no, no, you're gonna look more about it than we do." Yeah, I'm like, this kid knows yeah. what the hell yeah, he's was, talking about, <laughs> and he was like the coolest character the whole time. Yeah, and there were some adults that were getting upset about certain things, and I'm like, "Man, yeah, this well, you don't get yeah, you don't get to be uh, a high level magic user in in original D and D without uh, being level headed in some ways." So yeah, I mean, that, but that's a good point, right? Yeah. Like, I we, I have gamed with literal children, and it's been a fun, enjoyable, and great experience, but. Be, to be honest, right, there are a lot of people who have that say Stranger Things moment. Maybe not in the 80s, right? Like it might be now or in the 90s or whenever you grew up. Um, and and it's an unstructured, <laughs> you know, adolescent time. And tempers are flaring and hormones are raging and you, you just don't know how to act. And it just takes people a while to learn that. That's what I mean like by it being the elephant in the room is that these things about them being bad role players or bad teammates, this needs to be considered because a lot of the people we're talking about we're not talking about adults, sometimes we are. But when we're talking about children and adolescents, then you know we need to consider that, right? That's sort of a caveat, right? Yeah. Uh, and one that I never really see brought up when people are talking about power gamers. As far as them being bad role players, to me this comes from uh, characters that don't fit tonally because uh, you know the DM and the rest of the group are trying to do, they're trying to do a gothic horror or whatever, and you're over here with a, a character that's uh, you know, rules appropriate 
but not necessarily tonally appropriate. Uh, that can happen sometimes if you're not if you're only considering mechanics yeah. and you're tuning out everything else about the campaign, or you are one of those people. A lot of min maxers and optimizers. You tell them that you're running a campaign and. Bam, they've got their character already. You know, <laughs> they've got it already uh, made up and, and they're ready to go. And it's like, well, wait, we, we haven't even talked about what kind of game we want to run, where the setting's going to be, who everybody else is mm -hmm. playing, all these considerations. That, Don't you know. worry about it, dude. I'm going to cut everything in and have it <laughs> right. <sword> anyway. <laughs> right. It's like, well, <laughs> not want to worry about it. Yeah, yeah, and so this minute. this sort of like concerned with only the mechanics uh, can can extend from character creation into the actual play itself, where maybe they don't get into character, maybe they never describe things from a, a first person perspective. If you're looking for an immersive experience of role playing, where we're firing on all cylinders, everybody, if, even if they're not doing the silly voice, they're at least uh, speaking in character as their character. Yeah. Um, same with a dungeon master, and you have someone who's over there like, I do 12 damage, alright, 13 to hit, 12 damage, I attack the first goblin, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, we fucked him up. Yeah, that's it. Who's uh, next? Who's next? <laughs> then that's going to take you out of that experience. Yeah. But guess what? Talking about your play styles and what kind of game you want before you start the game was one of the ways you can... Anyway, you guys know this already. Yeah, we have an episode on zero session, <laughs> session zeros. Anyway. Uh, and so it's disruptive to his immersive play. That's sort of the what I see as the main drivers behind uh, why they're bad role players. And yeah, if yeah. that describes you, if you think that describes you, then think about it for a bit and then think about how the ways you approach the game might be like jarring other people out of it. And you hope that they are doing the same for you, right? You hope that, that mm -hmm. and you, you know, it's, per, it's a, a reasonable ask that they do the same for you, right? Uh, and of course, if they, can, if they can be a detriment to role playing, then they're probably not going to be a good teammate. You would think, yeah, and sometimes this does happen, right? Especially when you think of like spotlight time and which is really, to be honest, how much time a one-on-one -on -one player gets with the dungeon master who is usually the person who's driving the game forward and, and progressing things, even if the players are selecting where to go. This sort of focus on their, usually their character, right? They're very focused on their character, how they built it. Oftentimes they know everything that they're going to do with their character before uh, play starts, they've got mapped out and everything. They're there are some players who maybe see that and in a similar vein of like, yeah, you didn't create a character that was appropriate tonally for the rest of the game. Well, you showing up with a fully fleshed out character while the rest of us were going to show up to make characters as a group, like we now feel like you're not a part of this thing, you know, mm -hmm. that can happen. If they're not very good at power gaming, <laughs> if they're still learning how to do it, they're, they're still learning and there's someone who's better at it than them. That's happened to me before where I've been the, the person who another power gamer gets resentful of. Mm -hmm. And in that situation, I was trying to like, hey man, let's just look at your build, right? Like, let's sit down and chat yeah. about it. It doesn't always work out uh, that way, and sometimes it can lead to friction, or if there's conflict over a magic item, or, well, or something I, like that. I, yeah. I, yeah, I was going to say, that's that's kind of one of the biggest spots that I've seen from oh, yeah, Timbers yeah. Flares. We get a couple of power gamers, and there's only one there's magic only one of the, sword oh, in yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah, you can see it. And that's know. why, to me, it's just like, just roll, roll off. Roll random. Like, roll like, off, man. Roll like, off. come on. Yep. You know, the splitting of, uh, of items to me should be kind of a communal thing. You're obviously going to use this and it's going to benefit you yes. more. You're going to use this. Most of the time that's how I see it where yeah. yeah, but there are times where a, the play style like power gaming where it's like yeah, we would both use this and if you're not like talking to each other, if you're not if you haven't built up that rapport, if you haven't mm -hmm. built up that practice, then it can yeah. get it can get nasty. And so yeah, the yeah. hackles start rising. Right. And and you know, let's say the other person just wants the item that the power gamer wants. Doesn't even have to be two power gamers, but a, a source of friction is sort of an example of, of how uh, that resentment can build. And then to me, the big one, the big, big one that leads to, to this sort of like accusation that they're not good teammates is that they criticize non-power gaming players. Oh. That is the big one. Oh, the and to me, that's the one where you're just like, no, nah, man, you don't, you, this is not how this works, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, it's something that I will quickly put a stop to if I see it. I see it less mm -hmm. now, but it happens, right? And Oh, you didn't take that spell? Yeah. Mm -hmm. why, why not? Right, that kind of thing. It's why like, not? Well, yeah. that's because I didn't want to. You know that that spell does this, right? And there are two things that I usually want to say to those, which is number one, you don't know how I run my game. So you cannot make that assumption that that spell is a bad spell. You know, you just know your white room theory crafted uh, opinion on it. And then the other one is just like, you don't get to tell another player how they should enjoy the game. No one can compel you to play the game and no one can compel you to play it a certain way. And if they try, you should leave. 
yeah. you know, or ask that they leave if they seem to be the outlier. I, I don't want to be too, it's the big one, right? Like just shut up about it. Oh, no, no. Yeah, and, the, 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 side, the side, seat dri- side seat driver, it's like, right. hey man, we know that you have, you got, you got, you, a, thing going you got a thing on. going on and you know it's awesome because you keep telling us. Right. That's great. I'm doing my own thing, and and I, I want to offer a bit of a, a, a bit of sympathy and a bit of of, of camaraderie with the power gamers who fall in, into that uh, category because it is often a, a thing that you're excited about. Yeah, you got a kick-ass thing, right? Like you made this character; it's awesome. You know, you just sort of see the game as a series of black and white choices where there is good and bad, and and these are the best options. Yeah. And you, you feel excited and exuberant about sharing that. But sometimes that sharing and that excitement and that eagerness uh, when it's shared with another person doesn't come across as like, hey, let's look at this thing together and be excited about it together. It's let me drag you into this thing I'm interested in yeah. and talk your ear off about it. I've noticed you've come to my TED Talk. Right. I'm going to yes. be telling you how you should play your Welcome character. Welcome to my now. marathon TED Talk <laughs> session. So what is the next step, Jim Davis? So, uh, you know, apart from stating the obvious, which is that there is no inherent conflict between power gaming and role playing, that power gamers can be immersive role players, they can Mm -hmm. develop deep and satisfying story arcs for their characters and bond with other characters, Mm -hmm. they can be, uh, you know, good team players who contribute to the overall benefit of the group, both, you know, in, in every way. These sort of like power gamers can never do X because their power gamers are as much role playing snobbery as any other trash opinion that you have about play styles. What I would like to do here is like, let's power gamers out there, if you've made it this far, and you've not just like thrown your tablet into the street or burned your computer in rage, let's repair our reputation, Mm. right? So there are three things that I think that we can do. And I think that it is incumbent upon us to show the rest of the role-playing community and to, in all of these spaces that you find role players, to do things to repair uh, the bad reputation that power gaming has. And one of those is consider why your style is important. What is it about power gaming, about optimizing and getting the most out of a system, of, of being a badass or whatever it is that you enjoy. Why is it that this style appeals to you so much? And both demand a respect for it from yourself and respect other players' play styles because this is not the only way to approach the game. Mm-hmm. And the great thing about this is people with multiple play styles can make it work and mesh together if they're willing to talk about it and respect each other's uh, you know, opinions about the game. So that's sort of the first thing. Think about it. Why is this important and how can you, uh, you know, show others that, <laughs> that you're going to treat them the way that you would like uh, yourself to be treated? It's golden rule. Mm. The second one uh, is to get, try to get as invested in the game as it's played and its events and the setting of it as you're invested in your character. Yeah. And sometimes that's, a, that's tough, right? You might not be, be as interested in, say, the other characters and, uh, because you know, they're not your characters. Try to find something, something about the game or its setting that brings you out of this, like, I'm going to focus only on my character and start looking at like, your character's place in the world and how they connect to it and their relationships with the NPCs and PCs around them. And maybe there's something interesting going on yeah that you can latch on to and build on. It has nothing to do with mechanics. It has everything to do with the role play and how things unfold, right? Oh, well, definitely. I mean, why just sit there with your character saying, oh, I'm going to be the best? Well, the best what? Learn about what's going on in this world. Oh, well, there's a there's a fighting tournament every year at this one town. Oh, yeah. well, I need to start training for that. Right, and, right, And so right. that you can actually get invested so you can go and prove that you're the best. Sure. And you can still be a power gamer, yeah. but now you are invested in the world and you have a goal in yeah. the world that maybe your players can help you out with. Yeah, yeah. And as sort of a corollary to that, that uh, understand that spotlight time is a big thing. Like how much attention you get from the dungeon master, how much effort and time that they spend prepping is put into your character is a concern. And while you don't need to like agonize over it, these are mm-hmm. choices that everybody's making at, at once, you do need to sort of like keep it in mind. Just pay attention to it. Be mindful of it, right? Like, yeah, I've, I've spent like the last 30 minutes dealing with this thing because of a feat that I want or, or a mm-hmm. special ability or, or something. Like I'm trying to, you know, angle for something, which is a lot of what power gamers are often accused of, of like, you know, spending too much time, you know, tying up the DM to get a, a you know, a little benefit yeah. or something. So just be considerate uh, of that. And, and, you know, particularly as you look at the game as a whole for how you're going to 
uh, sort of develop your character and, and, and find a place for them in the, in the game. Because besides, Jim, if you're doing power gaming right, you only need one swing of the sword. Oh, right. right. No, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, finally... I kid. I kid. <laughs> finally here is that you have uh, an asset. You have a gift. Uh, you, perhaps you have a, a keen mind for rules and the system as a game. Mm -hmm. One of the things I like about power gaming is it takes the role-playing game part seriously. The RPG is a coherent thing and I think we're in a, in some ways in a moment where the RP is, is seeing a rise. I mean, say you go on a, a role-playing forum and there'd be a character optimization place where they're like, I don't know, 100,000 active threads and a role player's advice thing that has maybe a, a, you know, an order of magnitude less. And it was like 50. Uh, right. It's sort of clear, to, <laughs> clear to me like who's coming online to talk. But if you're the kind of power gamer like I'm familiar with, then that rules mastery, that passion for the rules, that passion for the game as it's played yeah. is, um, is an asset. And if it is welcomed and, and you can solicit that, you can say like, hey, if you would like help with this, I enjoy working out character builds. I would love to talk to you and help you with whatever you want. And if the other person says like, hey, no thanks, or that'd be great, regardless, you let them take the lead because you're just offering your help. And if they don't want it, we say like, all right, no problem. Um, but they might, and they might not realize they want it till they you know, ask. Uh, mostly it's just about, you wanna share, you have exuberance, you have excitement, you, you, you know, you, a mm -hmm. passion uh, for something, and that needs to be tempered with sort of the needs of the rest of the group. And just asking and being respectful is a great way to, to lay that foundation, you know. And who knows? Maybe at character creation, nobody cares, but three or four, I, there have been times when like the power gamers were like, oh, I'll help you with that. No, I'd rather have this choice. And then like three or four levels later, that player goes like, yeah, I, yeah I, I'm not, not having a good time. Like, can you, can we talk about my character? I, should, I think I should have taken that thing. I should have taken that you know, thing. And I have seen that. And, that. and that happens when you have someone in a group who's not pushy, who's not obnoxious, who's not, you know, just kind of being... Uh, you know, mm -hmm. a jerk about it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm trying to get there, Jim. It's all right. I think you actually, not, honestly, though, for real. Like in terms of like, I, and this is a bit of a personal uh, aside for you guys. Like I played with Pruitt for damn near 20 years. Go, going on 20 years, yeah. and Pruitt went from a what are you talking about character anything, right? Like <laughs> your first character is an elven, is a your Driss clone, right? Yeah, it was a Driss clone. Uh, <laughs> and then for years it was, we. the joke was that Pruitt has six characters he plays. Yeah. And that we will, there's a combination of them in every character mm -hmm. that we will find. And part of the fun was sort of figuring out which combinations it was, but they were always power gaming. And yet over the last few years, as you've played with other people, mm -hmm. had other DMs, other players that you've been with, played on different formats, uh, your passion for bringing a character to life, yeah. for making them a real person in the world, has only bloomed. And to me, that you're proof positive that you can be both power gamer and role player at the same time. You don't need to make that either oh, or choice. No, no, not at all. Uh, you guys should check him out, you know what yeah, I'm saying? Like, yeah, best example, Seth Penhollow. Uh, I power gamed cowardice, <laughs> and I won Call, call of Cthulhu. Hey, and, for, <laughs> I would argue that cowardice is a power gaming option in Call of Cthulhu because it will see you to the end. You run away at the first sign of any combat, so you never have to worry about dying. Everyone else dies first. You never open no the door. No one suspects Don't read the book. anything from you until the last moment, and you can stab anyone in the back. And yep. it's all it's all worth it. Trust there you me. Go. There you go. Power gaming one on one. <laughs> head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel. Which way to the beach? Which way to power gaming? Power gaming is that way. Who's got two thumbs and likes to power game? This guy! <laughs> That'll be the intro.